Okay, so I guess we start. Oh, I'm so excited. So one reason to be is finally back at GDC. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Laia B. I am from Uruguay. It's a tiny, tiny country in the middle of Brazil and Argentina. Not a lot of people have heard about that country. So uh, I'm the co-founder of Pinsir Games. Oh, hi. And uh, I am the president of the Uruguayan Game Developers Association. Uh, I also help to coordinate the Latin Video Games Federation. And I am part of the Game Awards Future class. And I, um, that's me. So a little bit of context and history, because I think that it's super important first. The One Reason to Be panel was started in 2013 by the legendary Brenda Romero and Lee Alexander. And it was started and inspired by the One Reason to Me movement on social media. So it was a place to give visibility and a voice for women in our industry. Then three years later, the amazing Rami Ismail uh, Take the, took the channel, uh, the panel, and he started to organize the panel uh, with a geographically diverse approach to discover the voices of the underrepresented folks from all over the world. So in, in 2019, uh, GDC asked me to organize it. I, I asked them why, but uh, it was imposter syndrome, I, I guess. And uh, so, yeah, so then the pandemic hit. So we had an online version of it. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, GDC called it cancelled. So that was a very sad moment in my career because I really felt like I let the panel down uh, and the history behind it. But fortunately, a lot of game developers on social media expressed their discomfort. And I sent a submission. It was a little bit hostile, like <laughs> I have to admit. <laughs> And, uh, but they listened and they understood. So, um, so yeah, uh, and here we are again. That's uh, part of the, the story. <laughs> so combining uh, Brenda, Lee, and Rami's vision, uh, one reason to be today honors women with geographically diverse approach uh, from all over the world. So, so perhaps I, I think that it's super important now to ask ourselves, why does this panel actually matter? Um, why is it important even now? Why listen to different backgrounds and stories from different cultures and countries that maybe we are not even familiar with? So uh, because when we see on the news that thousands and thousands of people are getting slaughtered right now, it's very difficult to think beyond a number. Who are these people? What do they lack? And what are their dreams for the future? When we read about the thousands of layoffs, it is actually challenging to think about their lives, their families, and how will they make it while companies keep getting richer and richer. So why this panel matters? Because the industry is about people. It's about the video games that exist that move us. It's because there are real, real human stories and people doing these games. And there is passion put in every title that we love. And more because the future is female. Women sustain the economy. Women are the ones raising the future generations. Women hold the hope for politics and a more compassionate world but yet we still don't listen to them enough. So with, uh, without further ado, I present to you these amazing five women. And I'm going to ask this for later, but please, is this really important that you rate this session because it, it really helped us to maintain it alive and to keep on bringing amazing women from all over the world next year too. So I'm counting on you guys. So uh, we have Bahia, uh, Bahia come from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. <laughs> ABB from Washington, United States. <laughs> Alexandra Marzuka from Santiago de Chile. 
Indrani Gangula from Mumbai, India. And Isabel Vasquez from Cancun, Mexico. So the first one is Indrani, your turn. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Hi, my name is Indrani. Before I begin, once again, I would like to call for a complete ceasefire in Palestine. But with that out of the way. <laughs> I'm from India. Actually, there's a little bit more to that. I am from West Bengal, Kolkata. But I grew up in Mumbai, Maharashtra. No, wait, scratch that. I grew up in Nalasopara, which is a small town outside of Mumbai, Maharashtra. We got our first McDonald's in 2018. 2018. Do you hear us say that? 2018, that's not that long ago for us. <laughs> but now that you have that cleared up a little bit, I wanted to talk to you about games. I run my own game studio. It's called Toronto Games. We're making what we like to call culturally rooted and universally human games. Our first project is called The Line. It's a game about the partition of India, but more on that later. But to keep the lights on, I also work as a marketing consultant and a freelance game designer with a bunch of different tabletop and video game studios. I've been working in the industry for five years, maybe a bit longer, but I work in games. That's crazy. But it didn't always feel like this. It didn't always feel possible to make games. It felt like a bit of a pipe dream. Hell, it still feels like a pipe dream. I have no idea why I'm giving a talk at GDC. <laughs> like, not just one, like three. That's insanity. But as a terminally online kid whose parents didn't understand internet safety and parental control, I was exposed to a lot of the world outside of Nalasopara. <laughs> it was always like far, far beyond reach in the sense that I'm like, there's no way I will ever experience this in person. So, you know, maybe from the comfort of my computer. But I knew that it was there, just out of my grasp. And the same was true for video games. Like, my first experience of this game called The Last of Us was a YouTube playthrough when I was like 11, right? I was like, I'm never gonna play it. Who's gonna be able to afford it? Not me. <laughs> but it took a few years, saving enough money, convincing my parents that I would buy a studying computer so that I could, you know, also maybe run play games. Once that happened, I played this game called Portal. Have you heard of it? It's very indie, nobody's heard of it, you know? Just small studio made it. Um, but as a girl who, you know, doesn't talk much and was surrounded by a sassy robot telling her what to do, who was trying to escape the confines of Nala Sopara, no wait, it's called Aperture Science. I think I was like, wait, if she can do it, so can I. Am I just chill? You know, like if, if, if games can make me feel like this, if games can make me feel like it's possible to escape, then sign me up. I want more of that. So. If she can escape, so can I, right? This was a bit of a leap, but I was a kid, so spare me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I need to make games. I have no idea how. The Indian education system has a pretty narrow definition of success, right? You study commerce and become a chartered accountant. You study, you know, law, become a good lawyer. Have you considered being a doctor? You've probably seen these tropes in media, <laughs> and they're a little bit true. Um, but there's this really fun game about performing surgery that I recommend to people who tell me I should become a doctor. Um, they lose me then. But you see my point. I was consumed by the idea of making games and playing games, but I had no resources to start and nobody to lean on. As I graduated with this degree in mass media, I started working like traditional jobs, right? Um, it was sucking the soul out of me, but everybody was like, this is good enough. You're, you know, you're making enough money, you're successful enough, and, and that's good enough. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. And no one's gonna hire a, a kid with no formal training in game design from India, even for entry-level roles in video games, especially not in the West. But I kept playing all the games I could get my hands on, and I kept engaging with games in the weirdest possible ways. I got so into tabletop games that I started making handmade dice. You know the really shiny math rocks that you play Dungeons and Dragons with? I make them myself from scratch, it's really cool. <laughs> um, but and I became India's first dice maker. That's such a weird statement, but these dice were pretty enough that they got me a bit of like a following on social media. 
And I was like, I'm going to use this brief attention on social media to build a community of local players, right? All of these games still feel inaccessible to people who are living in my country. So we co-founded this community. It's called Desis and Dragons, which is now India's largest <laughs> TTRPG community. Um, I self-taught myself design, and I used my marketing skills, which I'd been applying to those soul-sucking jobs, to find other odd jobs. And because I was making dice and I had my own D&D community, people were like, oh, you work in games. You can, you can, here, we'll let you in. And all I realized is that what it takes for anybody to make it or find that first opening is for someone to see them. All I needed was someone to see me. And eventually people did. I got to crowdfund a trip to Gen Con. Is anybody familiar with Gen Con? It's like a TTRPG, big, sweaty convention, right? Do not recommend, maybe a little. Um, but yeah, the Indian TTRPG community who I'd been working with, they all got together to crowdfund my, my trip to the United States so that I could go there and I could represent all of us as a community. Because they believed that what I was doing and what the work I was doing for the community was worth investing in, that my stories are worth sharing. It took coming to America with the monetary support of 85 people, two grants, a lot of perseverance, and sheer dumb luck of already having a US visa, which a lot of us aren't afforded, to have a real shot at making it. And not just as a hobby, but as a real adult paying job that my parents won't laugh at. In America, I met the right people, I shook the right hands, I said the right things, I landed the right gigs. I was also able to help people from our community. I talked to everybody about myself, but I also talked to everybody about all of the people who couldn't be there. I talked incessantly about the games they were making and all the incredible work that was happening in India that nobody was seeing. And I connected them with the same people I shook hands with, and some of those people now also find themselves calling themselves I work in games, which is really cool. What really surprised me, though, and really bummed me out, is how well it worked. By being here in this country in a room full of people like you, right? Physically being present here goes such a long way in finding success and feeling like, okay, maybe there's a real shot at this. And I felt like I had to do it again. I saved up for months upon months upon months to fund myself, fund my own GDC trip last year. And even then, I was only able to make it because I got a free pass from some kind of Samaritan. Again, it paid off in more ways than one. I met my cohort members from the Game Awards Future class. Uh, these are 50 at that time of, you know, thousands of people who represent, in their words, the best uh, bright, bold, and inclusive future of games. Leia is one of them. Um, I made new lifelong friends. Some of them are in the audience today, right? And thankfully, I found more paying work. It costs, let me check, 2,3332 rupees or 2,449 US dollars to buy an all access pass to GDC. The median salary of an Indian is 27,000 rupees or 330 US dollars. I will let you do the math, okay? Done? Cool. Um, I couldn't be the only one who was benefiting from doing this, right? People were starting to notice my work in India and my frustrations with the lack of a bridge between the global south and creative opportunities in the west was really starting to get to me. A friend and a mentor reached out so that we could work together and fix this. And when I say fix this, I mean try really hard, feel like we're not doing enough, right? There's this North American convention, it's called Big Bad Con. Um, and as a part of their POC programming team, I was able to scout for talent from uh, the Global South, specifically South Asia, and provide them with an all-expenses, visa-covered trip to the US so that they could come do what I did, you know, meet the right people, shake the right hands, land the right gigs. Here, we could individually match them with the biggest names and tabletops in video games with the explicit purpose of finding them jobs and landing them high intervention mentorships. I'm acutely aware that we were still operating under a broken system. We shouldn't have to be here to make it, but it's often the biggest catalyst in doing so. When I was helping five people, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of people I wasn't, right? But you do what you can. There's a saying in my family, and it's a family full of descendants of the partition of India. It says, it's in Bangla, and it goes like, 
আমি বেঁচে আছি তাই বড় কথা অ্যান্ড ইট রাফলি ট্রান্সলেটস টু ইটস এ মেরিকল দ্যাট আম স্টিল লাইফ ইটস এ মেরিকল দ্যাট ওয়ের স্টিল হিয়ার অ্যান্ড ইট টুক মি আ লং টাইম টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড ওয়াট দে মেন্ট বাই দ্যাট আই ইস টু চক দ্যার আপ টু লাইক ক্লাসিক বেঙ্গলি অপটিমিজম উইচ ডজেন্ট এক্সিস্ট বাট উইথ ইচ পাসিং ডে আই ফাইন দ্যাট স্টেটমেন্ট টু বি ট্রু ইন কাউন্টলেস ওয়েজ ইটস এ মেরিকল দ্যাট আই প্লেড গেমস ইটস এ মেরিকল দ্যাট আই মেক গেমস ইটস এ মেরিকল দ্যাট আই এম গেভিং দিস টক অল অফ দিস ইজ এ মেরিকল and without these miracles my story is the ones that the people from my community think i should be able to share would start to die i carry with me the stories of my mother from andhra pradesh my father from west bengal my friends and family from maharashtra and the only way i know to keep my story which is the culmination of their stories alive is through making these games but mine is in the only story to tell When I, was first, when I was first thinking of what my one reason to be a game developer is, all I could come up with was spite. <laughs> But I don't think that's accurate. I feel like that's a little too pessimistic, even for my taste. <laughs> my stories are worth sharing. But so are the ones of all the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Nepali, Sri Lankan, Bhutanese, Afghani, Maldivian devs who couldn't be here. All the folks from the Global South who deserve to be in this room in all these chairs, but aren't. In all of these chairs, in fact. See, I have a chronic inability to work in an industry. I need to be a part of its community. But having a community is a responsibility. It's a constant act of paying it forward, right? Holding the door open, letting the next person in. Ultimately, that's my one reason to be. I want to tell our stories. I want to keep our stories alive. I want you to hear them. I want you to keep them alive. And you can do that by playing our games. making games with us. If you head to the Explore floor today, away from the big, shiny sponsor booths, you'll find demos of games from across the world. Play these incredible games and then go find the ones from the people who couldn't be here, whose games are not at that very fancy expo. Go find out about these incredible games coming from India. There's Fishbowl, there's Palace on the Hill, there's Brocula. There's all the ones that I haven't named today. Keep our stories are live wait hold on don't take those photos yet there's something missing that's better <laughs> right yeah but with that said thank you so much to leia p brenda romero lee alexander rami ismail kate edwards and all my fellow panelists for bringing this talk back this panel back i think it's incredibly important that you're all here and please 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 keep our stories alive keep this panel alive thank you so much Hi, <clears throat> my name is Isabel Vasquez. I am video game producer, CEO of Pinkberg, Pinkberg Games, Women in Games ambassador, and Game Jam Plus organizer of Mexico. I am 42 years old, and at the age of 34, I started to develop video games. I thought I was old to be 34 and starting in video games, but now, when I was a child, I love uh, video games, but that I, I grew up, I drift, drift away from them. I got my degree in business administration and I became a sales manager. And at the same time, my then husband was looking for an artist to partner with and open a video game studio. I'm not an artist. But, and I didn't know how to develop a game, but I expressed my desire to be part of it starting i was willing to learn when i launched we launched our first game studio we were experienced success realizing two awards winning vr games and one mobile game we attend gamescom to show our work to publishers and we learn a valuable lesson about scheduling mishaps during gamescom i began questioning my life purpose and ponder leaving a legacy but with no knowing for whom or for what. When I, life went on, 
and I got divorced. I moved to Quintana Roo, and I thought I also managed the studio remotely. I decided to explore a different path and entered to the hospitality sector as a second job. I didn't tell any of my colleagues because I felt a bit embarrassed about going to do something other than video games. One day in the hotel, a talk of identifying child sex stories deeply impacted me, especially upon learning that Quintana Roo, where I reside, is known for being a hub of such activities. This prompted me to contemplate how I, an ordinary person, could help to changing these alarming statistics. Emotionally trained from remote work in the middle of the pandemic, my partner and I agreed to I should leave the studio. Although this seemed like a setback, I provide an opportunity to restructure my new studio and address the issue of child abuse in Quintana Roo. Through rich research, I discovered that while many children are linked to sexual abuse inside the tourism, tourism industry, even more children suffer abuse in their, in their families, within their families. I consult my sister, Nayeli Vasquez, is a psych psychoanalyst for guidance, and she supports us with a great consultancy on the subject that gave us what we need to the project. With the help of the writer, we create a game addressing this sensitive topic and on, alongside our studio. Learning. Learning that one in four girls and one in six boys experience child sexual abuse, according to the World Health Organization statics, statistics, was a harsh reality check. I realized the importance of prevention and education, and I felt uh, I felt I had the tool of video games to spread those, but I was conscious that people play to escape a real world of the real world. A reminder of something painful or traumatic might not help the cause of the game like Patito and the Bubbles. We know that developing a, a game, developing a game, it has its own challenge. I must have a budget and a business model to also be profitable enough to be able to develop the next game. We also want translators since we want the game in five different languages and we decide in a, in a mobile platform because of the wider reach, meaning we need licenses, mobile platforms, uh, marketing strategies, you know what I'm getting at all. All that becomes to money. We were fighting against the developing odds, plus the fact that culturally, abuse is a difficult topic, and in children, it's even more painful. Our society was trying to turn a blind eye even to the statistics in our country. The government of Quintana Roo, being the second state with the biggest tourism flow and being the number one in child sexual abuse and child, uh, sex child tourism, won't acknowledge or support our game. In Mexico, the role of to obtain funds for educational topics is very bureaucratic. You need to ally with very specific associations or foundations, which takes time, money, and a lot of documentation to uh, documentation work to prove what we are doing. I quickly realized my time uh, will be consumed by paperwork and politics. So against all of these facts, my team and I decided to embark on developing a game to educate children about setting boundaries and facilitate parent and child uh, communication. The team and the studio were built from wanting to meet the end goal. We had a few interns and the other professionals who wanted to support the cause. Some of them came and went as we developed. We all had to get second job since this was a non-profit game and the emotions ran high. As we start Patito and the Bubbles, we faced with difficult topics, conversations and downloads. It was very emotional, educational and psychological project. In our first campaign to lift it uh, off the ground, we asked for 2.5K, which was met with the total of 20, 250 US. We always heard the same reason. The project was a good cause. 
ton of hearts, but just a few had the guts to publicly support it. We participated in the Unity for Humanity announcement and got the best news for our project. We were one of the eight winners of the category winning 25K to be able to develop the game, bringing hopes back and reaffirming this was a very important project. Thank you, Unity for Humanity. We were joined by two psychopedagogical consultants and with the money we were able to pay our current team for a few months. We were also able to test the game with a specific organization for the detection and prevention of child sexual abuse and confirmed that the game improved communication between a child and his parents. We are now in our final stretch to finish Patito and the Bubbles. We want to keep on testing uh, and we ask for you support so it can reach a larger community. This full of, heart being, full of heart video game will keep on looking for support, exposition, exposition and donation from developers, associations, and others that contact with our case and the case that Patito and the Bubbles fight for. I still work on my hospitality job, something that I've learned to realize with the help of my friends. Because of it, I found the strength to develop this important project, bringing me the sense of purpose I was looking for. Success takes time, and we can engage in other activities. They are steps to keep growing and reaching our goal. I am immensely proud of my team and grateful to the people who collaborate. And my one reason to be is this game is the beginning of our journey to create games for a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pahia Khan, and I'm a game designer, writer, and filmmaker from Johannesburg, South Africa. I wasn't supposed to be on this panel originally. My friend Estelle Makoba was meant to be here talking about her game studio. Tiny Baby Crown, but she couldn't make it, and I don't know, I guess standards have dropped in the industry, so they asked me to fill in. Um, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> Over the years, one reason to be has always been my favorite part of GDC. It feels like the most important aspect of it to me, and it always makes me feel proud to be a part of a community that has such kind and smart and brave people. I always leave feeling better and hopeful. So there was some pressure in being asked to be on this panel only a few days ago because I didn't think that I could do it justice since I feel full of hate and I'm angry pretty much all the time. As game developers, the past few months haven't been easy because of things like mass layoffs and dwindling job security. And as a developer from the Global South, where opportunities for working in video games are already so limited, trying to get a job in video games is pretty much non-existent right now. As people, the past few months have been horrific because there's a genocide currently happening in Palestine and Congo. I think most people have been feeling like they're suffering from a form of insanity watching the decisions that world leaders are making, which further destroy the lives of millions of people, despite people globally calling for a ceasefire, which of course is the bare minimum. The months that have passed since the 7th of October have exposed so much of the rot in this world on a global scale. For instance, I didn't know that around 70% of the world's cobalt is sourced from Congolese mines. Colton, used in producing gaming consoles, laptops, and other devices, is extracted in Congo by means of child slavery and unsafe labor practices. That tweet about wanting shorter games with worse graphics is evergreen. The constant demand of wanting better from video games, graphics, or console-wise is actively killing people. Sometimes I forget that there are other feelings that are possible to feel. Like when I wake up because my nephew is driving a car on my head because he thinks that my hair makes a good track. I've been thinking about my nephews a lot on the strip because of how good they make the world. 
Most of the conversations that I've been hearing this GDC are about how awful the state of the games industry is, and people are right. It makes me want to scream and run away because nothing good feels possible. But then again, I get a video call from my nephew, and he asks if I've seen Blippi and Mika while I'm in America, and if I'm bringing him slime, and when am I coming home? It's okay to feel nice things, even if everything is utterly horrific. It's vital, in fact. I don't think he coined it, but there's this phrase that I learned from a Buddy Wakefield poem that goes, hope is not a course of action. When I was a teenager and I heard this, and you know, I thought I was like so hard and edgy, um, I thought, so true, Buddy, you know, what does hope do? Um, it sets you up for disappointment because everything will always be bad. Um, Obviously, that's rubbish, you know. If, if people in my country didn't have a hope of seeing a South Africa free from apartheid and didn't let that hope mobilize them, we wouldn't be a free country today and I wouldn't be allowed to be here. Sometimes hope is all we have and to still feel hopeful in such nightmarish and painful times is brave as hell. When I was in grade six learning about fossil fuels, I thought, why don't we just use them though and not worry about the future because we'll all be dead. I don't really know why I thought of this when I was writing this talk, but I think there's something in there about caring about people. We have to care about people and not have my grade six mindset because we know better and we deserve better from each other. Community can look like different things. Sometimes it's several toddlers who think the lyrics for Baba Black Sheep go, Baba Black Sheep have you any womb? Um, you know, like the thing that stores babies instead of wool? Okay. I don't know if I'll ever get a stable job making video games, and I don't want that to be the most important thing anymore. What I do know is that I love my nephews and every kid that I'll never meet, and that I can make video games regardless of whether I get employed to make them, and that we must never stop fighting for the liberation of oppressed people. Free Palestine, free Congo, and free all oppressed people globally. That's my reason to be. Oh God, I'm here. <laughs> Hi everyone. My name's AVB. I have made several video games. Um, mostly they have been for freaks. Um, I'm, I'm really, really ha happy to be here. Yeah, you might know of some of these games if you don't. Get freakier. Um, <laughs> I'm really happy to be here with all of these other amazing women and I'm also really overwhelmed, more than I was expecting. Um, being a woman in games is not something I ever thought I'd get to be. Um, but having gotten here, I have to keep going. And I'll be honest with you, as people have mentioned, the past four years haven't made it easy. Even on the good days, it's hard to feel good about the future of this industry. And on the bad days, it's hard to feel good about the future of this planet. But despite all of that, I have this ongoing, unshakable desire to keep making games, no matter how painful the process is. I never even thought about questioning it, but then I was asked to be on this panel, so I thought maybe inertia is probably not the best reason to say I should come up with something better. <laughs> what is really driving me? Why do I make art? And I did, I, I remember, you know, remember Twitter? They, they used to be funny on that, right? So there's this one guy who came up with these two main reasons for making art, um, which are horniness and revenge. And, you know, I've been driven by horniness, to be frank, for the, for the past 10, 15 years. Um, and I'm going to try and make it sound a little bit more cerebral. Um, to me, horniness is like this way of describing an honest sort of obsession and fascination beyond what you'd consider normal. You're, the naked things that just make you feel good, even when me what makes you feel good is kind of weird. Like I made this game about a, it's a polyamorous love transcendent space opera. That's pretty weird. Um, learning fighting games and uh, uh, combos and fighting games is something I really like doing too. And you gotta be a kind of weird fetishist to put that much time into doing that. Um, and maybe most of you have known the pleasure of playing a From Software game and wading through a poison swamp. And what are you doing there? It's a niche off-putting experience um, that many people would find pretty weird, why are you doing this to yourself? But for, for us, it's kind of the main reason that we play games. We want to experience something that's like nothing else out there. 
I think that this is, this obsession is what makes us good artists and what makes us, our work important. But the problem is, is that this love, or let's call it love instead of horniness so it gets a little bit more safe for work, but it's not enough for me anymore. I find myself unconsciously fighting my desires because I've got to sell these games that I've been making. And I keep on having this fear of making something that's too unacceptable, too off-putting. Acceptance and visibility seem higher than ever for us, but that warm and soft surface is concealing how things, hard things really are. We women artists are forced to balance reactionary pushback, intra-community needs, and publisher demands in an impossible dance that demands a type of perfection and purity for us that is completely at odds with our lived experiences. Things are hard now, and it's when it's ruthless and competitive and no one wants to hear our stories, I start believing the worst things about myself, that who I am really is unacceptable, unhealthy, grotesque, and dangerous, that there isn't really a place for us in our stories, that we have to lie and make it seem much more safe and sanitized in order for us to survive and try and give you a piece of who we really are. I'm spending less time making games for freaks like me and more time convincing people that I'm not a freak. So I'm trying to be here for this power of love, but I feel like I'm drowning under it. And without realizing it, I have been building resentment. My reason to be has changed to revenge. I mean, I wanted to share myself through my art, and now I feel like I'm sharing the shadow of myself while the real me gets angrier and angrier and more and more hurt. And there's no shortage of reasons to look around and feel bitter. We're living in an unending pandemic haze. I've seen my beautiful queer communities fractured and hurt with indescribable loss and pain. The industry and the world are presenting us with comical horror on a daily basis. And it's now at the times when things suck the absolute most that they've ever sucked. I'm supposed to swallow those feelings because this industry is so competitive and make the nicest version of myself? I don't want to. I want to scream. I don't want to be comforted when I feel bad. I want to make other people feel awful. <laughs> <laughs> I crave revenge. <laughs> um, we need to make weirder, angrier, freakier games. <laughs> I can't make a, thank you so much. Um, I, I can't make honest games about relationships and love if I don't explore the destructive, abusive, and problematic ones. I'm tired of self-censoring. I'm trying to be loving and soft, it's just not working. I think we need to be, Free here out there. I know that this isn't gonna be for everyone, but I'm here to make games for people like myself, not teach people about me. I'm here for the freaks, and I don't care how few of them there are or how weird they are. I wanna make a game that anyone can love, that anyone can play, with whatever tools are necessary for them to access that experience, but I wanna make a game for the weirdos that really speaks to their heart and soul, even if that means that not everyone's gonna like it. Well, I know, you, you know that like, this is nothing new, right? The, this artist has this annoying, <laughs> who made these slides? Uh, uh, the artist has this annoying, uh, uncompromising vision and the market in the world won't accept it. We've just got to accept reality and move on. But I think that's bullshit. I, I'm telling you, this is wrong. We're doing the wrong thing. We need to get weirder when things are tough, not more normal. Strive for niche appeal over mass appeal because things are more competitive than ever. I know this is supposed to be my one reason to be, but I hate talking about myself so much that I've decided to turn it all on you. And because my reason to be here is because of all of you, because of the cool games that you all are making. I wanna play them, I wanna make them, and I wanna get inspired by your own games. So I have some reasons right now why I think you should make more games for freaks. And this is why it's a good idea, actually. So <laughs> I think that like, one of the first things that I want to say is like a lot of us who are indies making niche games with niche appeal, it doesn't, why are we making games for mass appeal when we can't possibly have the marketing budget to, to, to back it up? Why not make the game that really, really appeals to a certain audience? Games fire and, by and for freaks have nothing to compete with because there isn't anything else like them out there. You can be good at everything and you'll just get buried under a wave of games that are 
pretty good at everything? Why not be amazing at one thing and really bad at everything else? <laughs> You have so much less to lose. And in compromising, we end up losing touch with the things that really truly make us unique. Um, I, ben Esposito, who's, who I worked with on Neon White, said, it's too competitive out there to not be a freak. <laughs> um, people will notice us if we're too weird to, anno to ignore, and AAA won't be able to copy us because they'll be like, can't touch that. <laughs> The other thing that I wanted to, we're so afraid of making people feel bad, but I think people love it. Sorry for stealing this comic. Um, uh, it's, I think it's vital. I think we're losing touch with a tool in our toolbox about expressing anger. I know it's a really hard sell. You know, gamers, like they want this really smooth, pleasurable experience, like that doesn't make them feel bad and doesn't challenge them, but that's wrong. People love feeling bad. Um, I do think about how, Miyazaki half jokes about having this kind of BDSM relationship. He's like, oh yeah, I make this poison swamp because I want to suffer through it. Oh, and when I get cursed, it's the best. I, I, there are so many people like that though. He's got his own niche freaky appeal and, and people are in tune with that on a mass scale. Um, maybe, maybe someone like me will not make a game quite on that same level, but I think we can go in that direction that the core, even to mass success, is really being in touch with the thing that makes you unique. I would like to push back on these tides, kind of like, oh, it's feel good entertainment, whatever. We should be daring to make people feel bad. Um, so I think that we have to do this together, though, because it's very easy for us to get buried in this. The more that us, of us that get burned out, the more that get harassed out of the industry or feel like they have to bury the most interesting parts of themselves to survive, the less reason I have to be here. I'm, that isolation, it's compounding. It's contagious. The real world is flawed. It, uh, the real world is beautiful, but it's flawed and ugly too. And when I don't see those jagged edges, I feel like it's because you're holding out on me. And I want to see that part of yourself, the part that you're scared, your ugliness, your bitterness, and your anger, because I think it's what makes you beautiful and it's what makes you unique. I'm here to play what you have made. So please bring more of yourself into your games because that's my reason to be. Thank you. So, hi. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Alexandra. I'm a Palestinian born in Chile. My dad arrived when he was five years old with his family escaping the occupation. And my mom is a second generation in Chile, Palestinian also. So, um, Palestini. my blood is Palestinian. Uh, I'm a professional musician, sound designer, and also a full stack developer, which led me to my current job as a software developer. Um, the reason I studied music in the first place was because music uh, makes life more variable, uh, fun, colorful. Um, it gives you an identity, and you can express yourself through it. You see, as a Palestinian, music always got my attention. Uh, Arabic music has other scales, tones, and notes that us Occidental music doesn't. It has fourth of a tone, for example, um, which makes Arab music so uh, recognizable and unique. On the other hand, there's rock, punk rock, or metal, uh, which are so political and controversial, and you can express your opinions or feelings so much through them. And that's their beauty, in my opinion. Um, and lastly, there's instrumental music, like original soundtracks, uh, which are the essence of every history being told through a screen. Uh, because, you know, the Lion King wouldn't be the same thing with Slipknot playing on the background. <laughs> so <laughs> it does matter. Uh, when I was studying, I knew I wanted to make music that uh, shakes people, that makes them feel what it is shown on the screen. That means that uh, I had a thing 
for uh, music for films, video games, and everything audiovisual. Uh, video games for me as a child were an escape, a shelter, and the best distraction ever. Uh, because uh, I had just a few friends uh, and some of my classmates building me. So uh, since I had always a thing for video games, I thought I could start there. That's when I started uh, studying music production for video games after I finished uh, university. And uh, later, I entered the first woman game jam in Chile, uh, where I met two of my current teammates. And uh, a few years later, I became one of the co-organizers. You know, my two teammates and I realized uh, we got along very well. So uh, we started making games for fun and the love for art, not to say nonprofit. Um, our first game was Amazing Amazon, uh, which uh, was a game that a mini game where you needed to save the burning animals of the Amazon. Therefore, we wanted to make games that made people conscious about the environment. Um, and later, uh, we needed more help, so we um, incorporated more people to our team and became Micro Mumbags, a team of six members passionate about video games. Uh, our second um, big release was on the Play Store, actually. It, it's a game called Buzz the Balloons. Uh, where you needed to help a bee get rid of the balloons that a clown at a child's party is making because it's getting on her, on her way, in her way of her pollination and it's polluting the environment. Uh, well, in that team, in Micro Moon Box, I was in charge of music and sound design, which I loved doing. Uh, so as time went by, um, other projects came up and later, by the time the pandemic hit, I joined the Aurora Red Game Dev, a group of women and dissidents that promote, help, and support the inclusion of women and gender dissidents in the video game industry in Chile. Um, and also, I started uh, my full stack developer career because I knew I wanted to program for video games, but of course I wanted to uh, take a look at what it's like to program on the first place. Uh, so later I took some courses in Unity and Unreal 5, so I could uh, be in the video games industry, hopefully for a, vi hope for, ah, hopefully for a living. Um, you know, as a woman in the fields of art, music, and tech, I've overcome many challenges. One of them being to know my self-worth and the value that I have as a person and professional, to love myself and to know that I'm capable of everything I put my heart and mind into. Just to make an example, uh, well, I, at school, I, I was made fun of for many things, like my physique or being Arab, blah, blah, blah. And in the university, um, when I had to um, present my final exam, which was a concert, uh, I was very nervous about it. Uh, so I turned to my teacher for some advice, and he literally said, put on a tiny skirt and you'll do great. So I know this is the kind of stuff we have to go through just for being us. So my number one reason to be uh, is all those women, gender dissidents, and everyone who has felt or feels weighed down, that they can't do something, or that nobody is taking them seriously or values them for who they really are. Because you know, you don't have to be in a AAA company or have a great name for this. Uh, when I uh, first started joining in, I thought that. I thought that I couldn't do much because I wasn't in a big company or actively working on video games or I didn't have a name, like a big name. Um, and I couldn't be more wrong. So I can tell you, and I'm certain, that you are already making a difference by being here and in the industry. You know, the path will open up if you love this, so you can do it. So you just have to be present and be you. Thank you very much.
Wow, thank you everyone. You've been amazing. I'm, I'm still like shocked and surprised by all of your stories, so thank you. So I don't need to tell you this, but uh, you probably noticed already that the world is getting weirder. Uh, living is getting more expensive for everyone in every country. Uh, we see war on social media, along with a new AI video with a cat with five legs. And some presidents spend more time fighting on social media than actually doing their jobs. And the industry, we need to wake up because the industry is starting to get small and smaller and smaller as fewer companies are controlling it. But the passion, the love for this media, the stories that we tell through video games, that is something that won't go away. And I believe that by defending the people and by empowering them, we hold a key for a better future. So this is a slide that Brenda Romero put on the first one recent to be in 2013. And I believe that this message resonates more now more than ever. And I believe uh, that uh, it really resonates with the working people in, in the, of the industry, with women, and, and with the underrepresented. We are not going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.